All right, fellow painters, this is a demo that's going to be about underpainting. And I'm going to start with the green. We're expanding the Zorn palette to include ultramarine blue. So we're going to mix the best green that we can with uh, ultramarine and yellow ochre. It's not going to be a super vibrant green, uh, but that's okay. If you would like, you could mix in a little bit of white, um, push the yellow to one side, push the uh, blue to the other side and uh, The reason that we're doing green is because in the reference photo uh, you see over to your left that has um, All of the reflected light is green because of the grass we're going to paint these sort of blocky objects and What we're going to try to do is Use this underpainting of green as as either the reflected light or as a basis for the reflected light, and we're going to try to get some of it to show through. And what I like about underpainting is it gives you a base color. It allows you to judge something almost immediately because you have a tone down. The white of the paper is usually pretty hard to hard to judge against, so. This is in a in a nice way, very um, pressure free, I guess. And you'll see, there's a certain point where, when you're painting something, painting an object, doing a quick study, you could kind of stop at almost any point and not really worry about finishing the painting um, because the underpainting is kind of carrying a lot of the weight, and you get the impression of what the painting is and what it should be because the canvas or paper is filled up already. So the only thing about underpainting is that you have to let it dry. So if you're painting an oil or something like that, you need to um, wait a day or two, depending on the pigments you use and how thick you go. Um, personally, I like the more opaque kind of underpainting. Some people do an underpainting that's a little transparent. I'm not a big fan. Um, just because I want a good base to build off of. So in this, I want to start by anchoring uh, the value range apart. This is kind of a dark underpainting. So I'm going to immediately go in with my lightest areas and block in the shape. It's also that these shapes on this block, uh, blocky sculpture are very obvious. So um, a little bit of yellow ochre, a little bit of white, and that kind of pretty much gets us our first color. Uh, I'm also mixing this fairly opaquely because I don't want the underpainting showing through here because it's. It, you'll notice that in the reference, the color of the block is has nothing to do with green in this one particular segment. Um, you know, you have choices over the edge handling on this. You could go a little bit soft edge, but because it's... um. A blocky sculpture and it's got all got hard angular edges I would go with hard edges and the easiest way to do that is to run your brush stroke right along the the edge line and then whenever you mix up a color um, especially when you're brush mixing like I am you want to look for a similar color that's out on the uh, page or out on the canvas and here there's a similar color on the lower block um, so I'm just going to lay that out uh, fairly quickly and take a stab at where it is. I think I'm pretty close. It's probably not exactly the right shape, but hey, you know, we're just getting started and we can refine all of this later. The other thing too is we're going to ditch the reference eventually and no one's going to see it. So all we have to do is create an interesting painting. After that, what I would, what I would do is look for... Um, sort of the next value down to differentiate. So there are these kind of bluish shapes on either side of this upper block, and I'm going to hit those. They're not highlight level light, but they're not dark either. So they need to have a certain amount of color in them, a certain amount of saturation, and they should probably have a little bit of white when you mix, mix these out. Um, because they are kind of on the lighter side. And there's a slight color differentiation between each one. So I'm gonna add a little more saturated blue to the one on the left here. Um, as you're mixing color, 
evaluate and think about what you put down. The more you think about what you put down, the more intentional you're going to be with the next layer. And when you think, you're analyzing, okay, did I get the right shape? Um, is that shape in the right place? Do I need to go darker or lighter with the next shape that's going to be next to the one that I just put down? Um, is it too saturated? Is it not sa is it saturated enough? Like, um, so here we're going onto the this plane that sort of faces the ground and it's picking up a lot of the green of the grass. We can't really get a good grass green with the limited palette that we're using. So we're going to do something close. And because the color modulates from top to bottom, I'm going to use the underpainting in kind of the middle of this sec section and then use two different greens um, to vary the color on either side. And these greens are mostly going to read as yellow. Um, because they are a little bit yellow heavy. And there's also a little bit of reflected light bouncing up from the lower block onto the upper block as well. So it's kind of a complicated lighting situation. And um, I've heard it said that every, every object that gets light on it is another light source. So light's constantly bouncing around from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. And the blue on this object is really coming from the sky, the atmosphere. Um, in this shadow, I picked up a, a tone of violet, and so I'm going to really push that uh, to read. So I'm adding in my uh, cadmium red light and mixing primarily that in ultramarine to get this very, very saturated and rich and dark violet. Um, the nice thing about this sort of thing is the, the shapes are clear and we can do almost anything inside the shapes. As long as we get the shapes right, um, we have a lot of room to play with color and how that color can come across. Um, even on the dark side here, there's a lighter version of this violet. Um, and that's largely because you're getting a mixture of the violet shadow and the ambient light from the sky. So mixing that in, making sure that it's dark, uh, making sure that it's distinctly darker than the than the bright highlights we established first thing, I think is really important. As you go through these things, be sure to like wash your brushes fairly often, um, especially when you make big color jumps. When you make smaller color jumps, it's not a big deal, but just keep your brush relatively clean by um, rinsing it out and then wiping it on a cloth. Um, so you'll notice here this, this shadow didn't really get to the right shape originally, so I had to modify that just a bit. Um, under that shadow, there's a fairly pale blue segment here. Um, but there is a certain amount of green because it's getting some reflected light coming up from the grass. So a shape that is semi-transparent and allows some of the underpainting to come through is probably going to be preferable here. Um, there could be like an opaque section at the top, but you see how with a little bit of transparency, it's kind of maintaining some interest there. Okay. Next, because that modulates slightly, because it is reflected light, there's going to be a dark bit right at the top. Um, so I'm using like the, the original color that I didn't mix correctly for the uh, uh, for the underpainting color, which is sort of a blue green, and fading that and blending that into the uh, the shape here. And then you know it's time to kick back and analyze. I think things are going fairly well so far because the shapes are starting to be clear and you're starting to get a sense of light direction and how light's playing off all these objects but I do need to complete more of the shapes. There's another um, blue segment of the block off to the left here on the bottom. So working with smaller brushes now, kind of getting really into it. And then there's another bit of violet on the left here where the light's glancing off a lot. And then there's another heavily reflected light area, which I'm going to basically wind up 
using a lot of yellow here um, and because it's kind of a yellow green that we're after. Um, if we were using a full palette, we would use a different yellow to get a more like vibrant grass green. But since we're using a, a an earthen palette, it's going to change things a little bit. And what we're working in is sort of a relative color mode. We're not working in absolute color. So in relation, how is this yellow working? With the addition of Mars black here, we're going to make some dark shadows for the bottom. And I've actually, it's not pure Mars black. I don't think pure black will work very well, um, almost ever. So there's a little bit of blue and maybe a little bit of um, a little bit of red in there uh, to kind of relate to the dark violet that we've done already. And I know there are multiple planes in this deepest shadow down here, but I can't see the differentiation in them. So I'm going to treat them as kind of one shape that's all the same, and then probably just run that shape all the way into the ground shadow as well. Because to me that makes a lot of sense. You know, you can you can lose a lot in the shadow and just allow that not to be the focus. Um, and I, you know, I wasn't happy with how dark that was. You know, it needed to go a little bit darker. So when you're painting wet and wet too, you have to remember that um, as you paint wet and wet, you're gonna mix actually on the canvas itself. So you need to make things like too dark or too light depending on the direction that you're going with it. Um, and you know, be sure to always kind of like look back and, and keep modifying things or keep adding areas that you didn't see or didn't just put in at the beginning because they weren't as critical or, or as important to establishing the main shapes. As soon as we put this ground shadow in, things are going to get a lot better um, because now we're saying like, hey, this is an object that gets light. It's sitting on the ground. The ground has a shadow on it. And we're going to add a lot of, of darkness to that shadow, push it, uh, push it further down. Now here, we need to begin to establish the light areas, um, which is going to be, again, a yellow-green. Um, it's going to come off fairly yellow. Part of it's because of this um, underpainting is green, so um, it's kind of tricking us into thinking that this is yellower than it is because we're judging the distance off of this green. But in the end, this is gonna this is probably going to work out pretty well. And we can add a little more blue to it once this is established. And again, I, I'm doing this one fairly um, transparently with a little bit of glazing medium in there as well, so that you can kind of see the underpainting through it. Here's where I'm kind of using the underpainting a lot. And you know, one of the things about underpainting too is that. You know, you went through the trouble of doing the underpainting, um, so you don't want to just cover it all up. Um, and to me, I think that's that's fairly important. Um, you wanna you wanna maintain some of the underpainting all the way through to the end, if you can. If you find yourself covering up the underpainting completely and making a lot of changes, you know, maybe it's time to put that painting down and do a different one and try again. But you know, in the end, it's all about getting a good painting. So whatever you have to do. See, this was is like a way too light gray blue. Um, so I need to go darker. And you'll see the, the mixing here. Um, so I make something darker, but it, it isn't really showing up very well. So go even darker, key it even darker, and push it in and you'll You'll see it mix on the actual surface here. You can see this has to be darker, distinctly darker than the the brightest areas of the object. And then I forgot to kind of put this in the background here. I'm kind of editing too, you know, I'm not including every single thing in the background as well. 
and see that turned out too bright because it's kind of fighting some of the highlights so coming back in knocking that down that's just going to help now um in the background in the reference you'll see that there's some extremely dark areas um so what i've done here is i've mixed some of the original color and some black to kind of really get a rich dark because as soon as i get this dark in the background that's going to push the object forward this is also going to allow me to kind of edit the edge of the object pretty readily and then in the photo too there's a bunch of tangents um, where things sort of line up where they shouldn't and this gives me the opportunity to kind of correct some of the tangents as well and that's the nice thing that, about painting is that you can quickly uh, improve your references and that includes photo references and when you're actually out physically painting something in front of you should you choose to do any kind of plain air painting or anything like that you don't have to stick to the exact reference and then here I think it's important to include some of the sky color because a lot of that sky color winds up in the object And you'll notice too that the color is getting pushed pretty heavily. You know, this is I could could have painted it in like black and white and gotten something much like realistically closer, but then that's not a very interesting painting in the end. And you know, what we want is something that says something about color. And then using the building to establish a little bit of color uh, above this highlight I think is important as well and then we can use some of the original blue-green for this building because it's fairly dark but it is like related in color to everything because this building is picking up a lot of reflected light from everywhere And I don't have to get into any specifics of the architecture, again, because this isn't an architectural study. This is an object study. It just happens to be a big outdoor object with architecture surrounding it. And then I can come through and I can use some of these old colors and kind of uh, mix bits and, bits and pieces and do some, do some fixes. And I wouldn't consider this to necessarily be like perfect and done. And if I wanted to get a really finished object piece, like I could probably spend an hour or two on it. Um, but spending an hour or two on it in terms of the demo isn't going to add a lot for you. Um, so give this a shot. You know, nothing means anything until you try it for yourself. So have fun painting objects and push those colors as far as they can go.